In college, if you take a lot of writing classes, like I did, the question, why are you interested in writing, comes up constantly. I had to write at least five different papers for five different classes about my journey as a writer, and I think I managed to credit a different something or someone as my main influence every time. You can't really be a creative type and not come up with new and exciting ways to frame your childhood. It's simply not allowed. I'd like to walk you through a couple of them now. The first time I had to write such a paper, I credited my grandmother. Due to your standard childhood home issues, I would spend a lot of time at her house, and every day I was there, she would set aside an hour and call it reading time. Now, most parents try this, but I think they miss the point. Most parents use reading time as, Good God, just do something quiet for a bit, please. Time. My grandmother understood children better than that. If you tell a child to go read for an hour while you do something else, the child will feel like they're left out, and they won't enjoy it. But, if you tell a child to read for an hour, then sit down and also read for an hour, the child will be more likely to read as well. Children are tribal like that. If everyone is doing it, they'll want to do it too. So, every day, we'd sit down and read for an hour. She'd usually sit in her recliner and read her Bible, or her daily bread, while I laid on the floor reading the Chronicles of Narnia or the Bernstein Bears chapter books. Something like that. In my college essay, I argued that these moments of reading inspired me to continue my journey into reading and writing. The last time I had to write such a paper, I credited my high school English teacher. To be fair, I was blessed with some incredible English teachers throughout my academic journey. This one in particular, though, left an impression. He was, quite frankly, a little insane, and had some surprisingly strong opinions on blueberries. He was also pretty good at the whole, you know, teaching English thing. One of the biggest things that stuck out to me was how he would always take some time to explain the lives of the writers we were covering, and not just your basic biographical information. He would always do his best to tell the stories of these storytellers. He understood that the lives of these writers were just as interesting as the stories they were telling. Now, I'm not saying he's the only person to have ever realized this, obviously, but he's the one that inspired me. Now, whenever I read a book from a writer I don't know, I always do a little research, learn a little bit about the author when I'm done, just to get the full picture. So that's why we're here. If you've been wondering why this podcast, which is supposed to be about John Milton, has just been me talking about my childhood, now you know. It's because I have an English degree. Or it was one long setup. Either one. So, in honor of my old high school English teacher, let's dive into John Milton. Now, if you know one thing about John Milton, it's that he wrote Paradise Lost. If you know two things about John Milton, it's that he wrote Paradise Lost, and he went blind towards the end of his life. A blind writer? What's next, a deaf composer? Looking at you, Beethoven. Well, that's why we're here. To understand Paradise Lost, you need to understand John Milton. And to understand John Milton, we need to start at the beginning. But... Before we embark down the road to Paradise Lost, we have to make a quick pit stop. I know we literally just started and we're already taking a pit stop. I know you told me to pee before we left, forgive me. But before we meet John Milton, we need to meet another John Milton. John Milton Sr., our John Milton's father. As a young man, Milton Sr. converted to Protestantism, much to the chagrin of his Roman Catholic father so much so that John Milton Sr. was disowned. Taking it in stride, he moved to London and became a scrivener. Now, a scrivener is a hard job to explain to a modern audience. A scrivener is basically just someone who can read and write. Because of the low literacy rate in England at the time, people would hire scriveners to do various tasks, typically legal or financial in nature. Milton tended to do more work on the financial side, and we know he was pretty successful. 
He married a woman named Sarah Jeffrey and had six children, three of which made it to adulthood, Anne, John, and Christopher. In his spare time, John Milton Sr. enjoyed writing the occasional poem. I mean, he never got any of them published, but he was not an unpublished man. He was also a bit of a composer. We know of about 20 compositions he wrote, one of which was included in a collection by Thomas Morley, a name you might recognize if you studied music history. One of Morley's Book of Madrigals, The Triumphs of Oriana, includes a piece by John Milton Sr., Fair Orion. I listened to a recording of it as I wrote this section, and it's not too bad if you like madrigals. We know he was also published in other composers' collections as well. Well, our little pit stop is coming to an end. John Milton Sr. was a man who stood up for the religion he believed in, despite it costing him his family. Then he went on to be a successful businessman and composer. History, however, only remembers him as the father of a more famous man. So, before we really got started, I wanted to give him his little place in the sun. And just a little housekeeping here. From here on in, when I say John Milton, go ahead and assume I'm referring to John Milton Jr. All right, our little pit stop is over. I hope you all use the restroom and grab some snacks for the road, because I think it's going to be a long trip. And I know we've been building up to this for a while, so let's really try to get this right. <clears throat> December 9th, 1608. John Milton is born. Thank you all for listening to this podcast. I hope you've enjoyed our journey into John Milton's life. Join me next time when... All right, all right, for real this time. John Milton was born in London on December 9th, 1608. As a child, Milton was hungry for knowledge, and his father was happy to oblige. He was taught to read and write, not just in English, but in Greek and Latin. The ability to read and write was a skill his father knew the value of all too well. In fact, Milton Sr. would often tutor Milton Jr. in things like languages. But, as all parents know, you can only put up with kids for so long. Eventually, you have to hand them off so you can get some peace and quiet for five minutes. That's why God made teachers. But to Milton Sr.'s credit, he didn't just hire Milton Jr. a tutor and shove him away. He hired him multiple private tutors. I told you his father was pretty successful. And, in all fairness, as far as I can tell, Milton Sr. continued to educate Milton Jr. when he could. The most notable of Milton's tutors was Thomas Young, a well-educated Scottish Presbyterian preacher and theologian. Thomas Young may have been recommended to the Miltons by their preacher, Richard Stock, a Puritan known for his fierce anti-Catholic views. Now, I was very tempted to try to make a joke out of Milton having a Thomas Young priest and an old priest, but that would require Richard Stock to be the old priest, and he was only in his 40s at this time. Now, I know that may seem old to some of you, but give it a few years. Trust me, it looks younger and younger every day. Anyway, if you were looking for Milton's religious influences, Stock and Young would be a great place to start. At some point, Milton also attended St. Paul's School. I'd love to give you more specifics on the when, but the records were destroyed in a fire. What we do know about his time in St. Paul's is that he met Charles Diodati, his closest childhood friend. While at St. Paul's, Milton started to develop a reputation of being very studious. He would often study late into the night, which was not an easy task in the 1600s. They didn't exactly have desk lamps back then. They had candles. And anyone who's tried to read by candlelight will tell you it's really not that pleasant. This studious reputation would persist. In fact, it was at one point believed that John Milton had read every book in existence. Now, this was an admittedly easier task back then, as the printing press was still relatively new, but still, that would be one heck of a feat. Which is why it's almost certainly not true, if only because of the vast amount of literature Milton would simply not have had access to. But it really paints a picture of how studious Milton was. Alexander Hamilton may write like he's running out of time, but Milton definitely reads like he's running out of time. The head of St. Paul's at the time Milton attended was Alexander Gill. Alexander Gill is another man I want to take a quick pit stop to recognize. 
He had a history of scholarship and was passionate about language and poetry. As a teacher, Gill would combine his passions and use the poets of his time to teach grammar. I wonder if that had any impact on Milton. He also wrote a book called, and you'll pardon my Latin pronunciation here, Lagonomia Anglica, which is a book on English grammar, written in Latin. That's right. He wrote a book on English grammar and decided to write it in Latin. Truly a man born for academics. In this book, he calls for English to be more phonetic and to expand the alphabet with three new letters, one of which was Engma. About a hundred years later, Ben Franklin would also propose a new phonetic alphabet for English. And would you look at that? His alphabet also included this weird Engma letter. Back in 1623, while at St. Paul's, Milton would write his first hymn. A year later, he wrote his first poem, a paraphrase on Psalm 114. Now, better scholars than me would tell you about how this poem lays the foundation for some of Milton's later themes, but that level of literature dissection is not really why we're here. We're here for the story of the man, and the man's story is about to leave St. Paul's behind. In 1625, Milton applied for Christ College, Cambridge and was accepted. In April 1625, he enrolled with William Chappell as his tutor. He declared his intention to study to be a minister. So, how did Milton's first year at college go? Do you think he put on the freshman 15? Well, to be honest, it didn't go great. Shortly after enrolling, Milton would return home to London. Now, there are two possible explanations for this, and historians are a little divided. So, instead of taking a side and arguing it like true scholars, we'll just cover both. Explanation 1. The plague hit. That's it. Cambridge was hit hard by the plague in 1625, and it's possible Milton simply returned home to avoid it. Nice and simple. Explanation 2. Milton was suspended for fighting with his tutor, William Chappell. It is accepted by both sides that the two certainly argued, usually about religion, since Chappell was an Arminian Protestant and Milton was more of a Calvinist Protestant. And don't worry, you don't need to know the difference. Just understand that for Milton, they're different enough to fight over. Explanation two is that these arguments eventually led to a fight, and that fight got Milton sent home for a year. Regardless of the explanation, Milton returns to London. While there, Milton doesn't just lounge around, he keeps on writing. Most notably, he writes his first elegy for his childhood friend, Charles Diodati. It's worth noting that Diodati was not dead at the time, wasn't that kind of elegy. In 1626, Milton returned to Cambridge. The plague was gone, and Milton had a new tutor, Nathaniel Tovey. Tovey proved to be a good middleman, since he was friends with Diodati's family, which endeared him to Milton, and he was friends with Chappelle, which helped ease the tensions. Tovey was also a Calvinist, so there would be no more religious fights. When he returned to college, Milton began to distinguish himself. He wrote several elegies for various Cambridge professors. These were the they're dead kind of elegies. He also wrote an elegy for Protestant soldiers killed in the Thirty Years' War. In these elegies, we start to see the influence of Horace, a famous Roman poet from the B.C. times. Horace would be a clear influence in Milton's writing throughout his life, so let's take another pit stop, shall we? After Julius Caesar was assassinated, there was an attempt to restore the old Roman Republic. Horace, recently graduated, joined in and fought a war against the empire. As you may know, if you're a big Roman history buff, the war was a horrible failure, and when the emperor offered a blanket pardon for everyone who fought against him, Horace quickly accepted. His real problems came when he got home, and realized his home had been seized and given to the veterans that had just defeated him. So Horace, now homeless, went out and got a cushy desk job that didn't really require much work. And in order to pass the time, 
or I started writing poems, and the rest is history. While Milton may have been wowing critics with his poetry, he didn't quite have the same effect on his fellow classmates. He was not well-liked, and the feeling was mutual. He would often insult the intelligence of his classmates in his letters, and his classmates responded by nicknaming him the Lady of Christ's College due to his fair skin. But don't think Milton reserved his criticism for his tutor and his classmates. He criticized everything, most notably the teaching he was receiving. He found the curriculum outdated and ineffective. Despite these hurdles and interpersonal struggles, in 1629, Milton received his bachelor's degree. Milton, being the academic he was, kept studying and received his master's in 1632. Still not content, Milton wanted to become a fellow at Christ College, but the college only allowed one fellow from London, and Michael Honeywood was already there. Now, I know you may be expecting a pit stop for Mr. Honeywood here. Maybe you think he's going to become Milton's rival, forever following him, blocking him from the positions he desires. However, other than founding the Lincoln Cathedral Library and being one of Mary Honeywood's 114 grandchildren, there's really not much to talk about. So let's stay with Milton. He's just graduated, and he needs something to do. Despite declaring his intention to become a minister at the start of his collegiate career, he doesn't pursue it, and, spoilers, he never will. Given that he had spent his college years arguing about religion with his tutor and despising his minister-to-be classmates, this is not exactly a shocking choice. So what does he do? From 1632, when he acquired his master's, to 1638, Milton studied. That's it. He studied. For six straight years, Milton studied and studied and read and read. Remember a while ago when I mentioned that there was this legend about Milton reading every book in existence? Yeah, when you spend six straight years in self-directed study, those legends start looking less ridiculous. Of course, during his study, he also kept writing. He was commissioned by John Egerton, 1st Earl of Bridgewater, to write two masks, Arcades and Comos, in 1632 and 1634, respectively. Masks, for those of you who don't know, are kind of like musical theater. They're singing and speaking and dancing and, of course, continuous praise of the patron who paid you to write it. Comos, in particular, is interesting. It's a story of a young woman kidnapped by Comos, the Greek god of revelry, Comus spends the mask tempting the woman with earthly desires while she repeatedly turns them down. In the end, uh, spoilers, her brothers show up with the attendant spirit and chase off Comus. The woman is then freed from her chair by a water nymph, and they all celebrate the virtues of chastity and temperance. Now this may seem like a pretty simple religious mask on the surface. Resist temptation and be chaste. And for some scholars, that's all it really is. But there is one little thing. The Earl's brother-in-law, the Earl of Castlehaven, had recently been executed on rape charges. That certainly paints a mask about temperance and chastity in a different light. In 1636, Milton's father retired, and he and his family moved to the countryside. A year later, in April 1637, Sarah Milton, John's mother, died. Losing a mother can't be easy, so in order to give Milton the proper grieving time, we're going to move on to someone else for a bit, Edward King. King was born in Ireland and attended Christ's College at the same time as Milton. They were both renowned for their poetry, and while Milton was unable to remain an academic, King had no such trouble becoming a tutor and a lecturer in 1633. So what was he up to in 1637? He was feeling homesick. He'd been away from Ireland for a while, studying and lecturing. So he hopped on a boat and set sail for the Emerald Isle. Unfortunately, this would be the last thing King would ever do. The ship crashed off the coast of Wales, and King drowned four months after John Milton's mother died. So it seems Milton's not going to be done grieving just yet. 
This time, though, Milton funnels his grief into the poem Lycidas. Lycidas is published alongside a group of poems written by fellow Cambridge academics in honor of King's death. Lycidas' inclusion in this group is, in a word, confrontational. While most of the other poems are written in Latin or Greek, Lycidas is in English. Most of the other poems are Baroque in style. Lycidas is pastoral. And perhaps most importantly, most of the authors are supporters of Arminian Protestantism and fans of William Laud, a prominent bishop in the Church of England. Milton's feelings on Arminian Protestantism were pretty well established in his fights with his first tutor, and his opinion of William Laud is not much better. Thus, Lycidas stands in stark contrast with the rest of the poems in this collection, just as Milton stands in stark contrast with the rest of the poet. Now, whether he was inspired by the death of his mother, the death of King, or just burnout after decades of study, Milton plans a trip through Europe. After setting aside some money for his retired father, Milton heads to France. That's right, John Milton graduated and took a backpacking trip through Europe. He's one of those people. Now, this was pretty common in Milton's day. It was seen as a big coming-of-age event. Milton's was a bit late, but it still counts. Remember, by 1638, Milton was 30. Bit late for a traditional coming of age, but hey, we all move at our own pace. Now, the details of this trip are not reliably known. The only real source we have is a political pamphlet Milton himself would write years later. So we're just going to cover some highlights. We know he saw the big sites like Notre Dame, the Louvre, and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He met a laundry list of notable intellectuals and artists, including Galileo Galilei. And while Milton's journey started in France, it didn't stay there. In fact, Milton was not a huge fan of France. He disapproved of Louis XIII, the power the Catholic clergy held in the French government, and the persecution of the French Protestants. So, he headed south eventually arriving in Florence, which he liked quite a bit better. He spent his time admiring the architecture, attending artistic and academic events, and schmoozing with intellectuals who admired his poetry. That's going to come up a lot, by the way, Milton attending artistic and academic events and people admiring his poetry. Using his newfound connections in Florence, he headed to Rome. In Rome, Milton attended academic and artistic events and schmoozed intellectuals with his poetry. While he was well-liked for his poetic talents, there were those who were less than thrilled with him, largely because Milton very vocally criticized Catholicism and the Pope. And, shockingly, there were quite a few Roman Catholics in Rome, and they did not appreciate that. Vocally criticizing Catholicism while in the seat of Catholicism? Richard Stock, his childhood anti-Catholic preacher, was undoubtedly smiling down on him for that one. From Rome, he headed to Naples, planning to continue on to Sicily and Greece. However, while in Naples, Milton hears about the Bishop's War back in England. The Bishop's War is basically the spark that will light the flame of the English Civil War, so Milton starts heading back. However, he soon gets more bad news. Charles Diodati, his oldest and best childhood friend, is dead. So Milton writes his second and final elegy for Charles Diodati. On his return trip, he spends another two months in Rome. While there, he befriends a Vatican librarian who lets him into the Vatican Library. He also befriends a cardinal and attends an opera with him. See, Milton can play nice when he wants to. After Rome, he spends another two months in Florence. After Florence, he spends a month in Venice. There he finds his true love, republics. Milton greatly admires Venice's republic government. He also, and this may shock you, attends a few artistic and academic events. From Venice, he heads to Genoa. Genoa offers him three things. Another republic to admire, Protestant Calvinists in power, and Giovanni Diodati, Charles' uncle. From Genoa, Milton starts heading back for real this time, 
and arrives in England in 1639, seven months after he decided to head home. So what can we take away from Milton's trip? He is now admired by a large number of European intellectuals and artists. He has a great admiration for republics. He had his first real experience with Catholics. And he is willing to argue his beliefs to anyone, regardless of how it made him look. We can also see the influence Milton Sr. had on his son. Despite many prominent Protestants of the time leaning towards the Puritan idea of demonizing music, John Milton clearly enjoys music. Everywhere he went, he attended at least one musical event. Well, now that Milton has had his coming-of-age trip, he decides to take another big step. He moves out. He leaves his father's house and moves to London. He quickly finds work as a tutor. His first two students are his two nephews, Edward and John Phillips. Now, while Milton tutors, we have to take a minute to talk about Smectimnus. Smectimnus is a group of five Puritan clergymen, Stephen Marshall, Edmund Cadame, Thomas Young, Matthew Newcomen, and William Spurstow. They very creatively just smashed their initials together to create the name Smectimnus, which I'm probably going to pronounce differently every time, so just bear with me. In 1641, a bishop by the name of Joseph Hall wrote and published a pamphlet called A Humble Remonstrance to the High Court of Parliament, defending the current church and claiming that no reforms were needed. Basically, it ain't broke. Don't fix it. In response, Smectimnus wrote and published a pamphlet called An Answer to the Book entitled A Humble Remonstrance, in which the original of liturgy and episcopacy is discussed which argues for widespread reforms and a restructuring of the church hierarchy. Spectimus thought the Church of England was a little too Catholic for their liking, and they wanted to reform it. Hall fires back with a defense of the humble remonstrance against the frivolous and false expectations of Spectimus. Now, it's important to note here in my original research notes for this podcast, I noted that Spectimus had just won this pamphlet war, for no other reason than they got someone else to use the ridiculous name Smectimnus. Speaking of Smectimnus, it's their turn, so they fire back with a vindication of the answer to the humble remonstrance from the unjust imputations of frivolousness and falsehood. This continues on for a while. So what's this got to do with Milton? Well, you may have heard me say that the T.Y. of Smectimnus is Thomas Young. This is the same Thomas Young that was Milton's childhood tutor. Thomas Young reaches out to Milton and asks him to write some pamphlets in support of the old Smectimnus cause. Milton, who is never one to shy away from sharing his opinion loudly and publicly, happily obliges. He writes five pamphlets against Hall and in defense of Smectimnus. This, in my mind, begins a transformation in Milton. Up till this point, we've looked at Milton as a poet, because that's what he was and that's how history remembers him. But... In 1641, with the publication of his first pro Smectimnus tract of Reformation, we see a new Milton. Civil war is looming. England is about to be thrown into the greatest upheaval it's faced since Duke William the Bastard landed on its shores. So, we're putting poetry to the side. It's time for Milton, the prose writer, to emerge. But, before we really get into the transformation we need to understand the English Civil War. Now, I'm not going to be covering the Civil War in great detail. I'm going to give you a cursory understanding and move on. If you need a topic to do a deep dive on, I highly recommend looking into it. Find a book, find a podcast, find a Wikipedia article, tweet Dan Carlin incessantly asking him to cover it, however you like to do your research. Be warned, though. Every time I read anything about it, I always end up going too deep, and before I know it, it's 2 a.m., and I've got work in the morning. Before we start, let's lay down a baseline. England has a king. His name is Charles I. Charles I is the joint king of England, Ireland, and Scotland. England also has a parliament. Parliament consists of two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The Parliament only has power when it's in session. The King 
can call and dismiss the parliament more or less at will. So you may be asking, why would the king ever call parliament? Basically, parliament controls the budget. Only parliament is allowed to collect taxes. So, if the king needs money, he has to call parliament. Now, Charles I, due to some previous animosity, does not like parliament. And, to be honest, parliament's not a big fan of Charles I. So, between 1629 and 1639, Charles does not call parliament. Not once. This is known as the personal rule of Charles I, since he was the only one with power. Parliament was not in session, so they had no power. Okay, so Charles has to run England with no money. Not an easy task. In fact, Charles realizes some things very quickly. Number one, he cannot go to war. War is very expensive and there is no way to finance a war without Parliament. Number two, he needs to be thrifty. No excessive personal spending and no big public works projects. You can't really build statues to yourself if you don't have money. And number three, he needs a way to get money without calling Parliament. He did this in a few ways, the most well-known being ship money. Basically, in times of war, the king could request a lump sum tax payment from coastal areas in order to pay for the Royal Navy. The logic being, if England doesn't have a navy, our enemies are going to land troops in coastal areas, kill you all, and take your stuff. So, it's in your best interest to fund the navy during wartime. It makes sense. Well, during the personal rule, Charles realizes that this is a tax doesn't technically need Parliament for, so he decides to push the boundaries a bit and make the case that, hey, you never know when war could happen, so I'm going to collect this tax during peacetime. You wouldn't want the Navy to be in disrepair if war breaks out tomorrow, would you? Now, there was a bit of a grumble about this, but the tax was collected. So, Charles pushes it further. He collects the tax again the following year. But this time, he requires it from inland areas as well. He basically made the argument that, hey, it's not fair that only the coastal areas have to pay. You should all be taxed equally. Now this angers a whole new set of people. And by the time Charles tries to collect the tax again, he faces significant resistance and a whole lot of people unwilling to pay. But it's alright. Charles can still run the country with the money he has, as long as the country remains at peace. But since people are already mad at you, why not make them a little madder? Do you remember William Laud? We mentioned him briefly when talking about Lycidas. The other authors of King's Memorial Poetry Collection were big fans. Well, he's gotten a promotion since then. He's now the Archbishop of Canterbury and de facto head of the Church of England and personal advisor to King Charles. Together, Laud and Charles decide to make some changes to the church. They introduce more ceremonial elements into the church, and this infuriates Puritans, who see any form of ceremony as a return to Catholicism. Now remember, Charles is not just the King of England, so why not try introducing some of these religious changes to his other kingdoms? Well, Ireland was basically Catholic anyway, so he decided to start with Scotland. The Church of Scotland was furious. And when Charles and Laud tried to introduce a new version of the Book of Common Prayer to Scotland in 1637, all hell broke loose. Riots broke out across Scotland, and in 1638, Scotland sent a message to Charles, refusing all of his proposed changes. Charles viewed this as an act of open rebellion, and he gathered 20,000 men. By 1639, he and his men were marching up to the Scottish border to reassert the king's authority. Thus begins the Bishop's War. As you may recall, this is the war that caused Milton to start heading back to England. But almost as soon as it starts, 
a truce is signed. Both sides agree to cease hostilities for a while. Charles and the Scots both want time to gather the necessary resources for war. During this truce, the Scottish Parliament gets to work, despite not being called. When Charles sends his representative to dismiss the Parliament, the Scottish Parliament simply says no. If the refusal of church reforms in 1638 wasn't a rebellion, refusing to dissolve the Parliament sure was. But the Scottish Parliament was not done there. They start passing acts stating that Parliament will be called at least three times a year, not when the king decides. Scotland is officially in full rebellion. Meanwhile, Charles and his advisors come to the same conclusion at the same time. They do not have enough money to win this war. So, for the first time in a decade, Charles calls the English Parliament to session. He also has the Lord Deputy of Ireland, Thomas Wentworth, call the Irish Parliament to session and ask for funds. In March of 1640, Ireland pledges to fund and supply 9,000 troops despite violent opposition from their citizens. On April 13, 1640, the English Parliament meets. King Charles starts by requesting funds to fight the war in Scotland. Instead of voting on these funds, Parliament begins to air ten years of grievances, things like ship taxes and other things they viewed as tyrannical. They clearly stated that they would not even consider giving Charles money unless he agreed to address these abuses of power. Charles, realizing he was getting nowhere, dissolved the Parliament on the 5th of May, 1640. So this Parliament gained the nickname the Short Parliament, since they were only in session for about three weeks. In June 1640, the Second Bishop's War breaks out. They call it the Second Bishop's War, but it's really just the First Bishop's War continuing. This time, Scotland easily defeats Charles' army, which is not thrilled about the whole not getting paid thing, and Scotland occupies Northumberland and Durham. Charles is left with no choice. He's out of money, and his army is decimated and disheartened. He must sign another truce. The terms were not good for Charles this time around. He was required to fully pay for Scotland's war expenses, pay Scotland £850 a day, and allow the Scots to occupy Northumberland and Durham until a formal peace treaty was signed. Well, here we are again, folks. Charles needs money. He can't afford to pay his own men, let alone Scotland's. That means he only has one option. In November 1640, he summoned the English Parliament again. Somehow, I doubt this one's going to be another short Parliament. In fact, this Parliament acts quickly. They pass laws stating that Parliament must convene at least once every three years, regardless of the King's summons. The King can no longer collect taxes without parliamentary approval, and the King can no longer dissolve Parliament without Parliament agreeing to be dissolved. Now that Parliament had secured its existence and protected itself against the whims of the king, they moved on to their other priorities. Not funding the war, but the king's Lord Deputy of Ireland, Thomas Wentworth. Thomas Wentworth, in a private meeting with the king and his advisors, had advised Charles to take the army in Ireland and use it to pacify the dissenters in England. Records of that meeting, as well as an eyewitness, were brought before Parliament who was, as you can imagine, furious. They called it treason and called for Wentworth's head. While the king initially refused, Wentworth himself wrote a letter to Charles asking him to let them kill him. Wentworth saw the war that was brewing and hoped his death would be enough to prevent it. So Charles reluctantly signed off and Wentworth was executed. For this concession, Parliament agreed to require all adults in England to sign the protestation. The protestation was a document that basically reaffirmed England's service to Charles and to a Protestant Church of England. Unfortunately, neither Wentworth's death nor the protestation were enough to stop the tide to come. In 1641, 
Fearing the power the Protestants had in the English Parliament, Irish Catholics rose up in rebellion. Parliament believed Charles secretly supported these rebels, but agreed that the rebellion should be quelled. Parliament agreed initially to pay for an 8,000-man army, but they were concerned. By law, all armies were under the command of the king, and Parliament feared Charles would take this army and use it to attack Parliament. So, Parliament signed a law that let Parliament assign military commanders. By 1642, Charles had had enough. He was the king, but he sure didn't feel like it. Being ordered around by his own subjects was getting old, and Charles decided to take action. He took 400 soldiers and marched on Parliament, intending to arrest five key members of Parliament on the charge of treason. The king asked the Speaker of the House of Commons, William Lenthal, to reveal their location. To the shock of all, Lenthal refused, saying, May it please your majesty, I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the house is pleased to direct me, whose servant I am here. The shocking thing about this was that this was the first time in history the Speaker of the House of Commons had ever said that they did not serve the King, but the Parliament. Frustrated, Charles took his troops and left. Now for those of you waiting for a spark that's going to light this powder keg, the King marching into Parliament with an army is less a spark, more a Molotov cocktail. After a few months of failed negotiations, the English Civil War began. King Charles versus the Parliament. So, let's look at some key factors that caused this war. Number one, religious tensions. England's Parliament was mostly Puritan-leaning Protestants, who viewed the King and his Archbishop of Canterbury as basically closeted Catholics. Number two, the power of the monarchy. Charles believed that he was pretty much entitled to do whatever he wanted. After all, he's the king. Parliament believed that there should be explicit limits on the king's power, and those limits should be defined by, guess who, Parliament. Number three, power. Plain and simple. Remember, Parliament only has power when it's in session. Charles stripped this power from them by not calling a parliament for ten years. So, now we've all got a brief background on the English Civil War, and I know I skimmed over or skipped a lot of it, especially the specifics behind the religious tensions, but trust me, there's no easy way to summarize this without skimming or skipping over large chunks of it. And that's not really why we're here. We're here for John Milton. Speaking of which, let's check back in on Milton, shall we? Remember him? As you may recall, we left off in early 1642. He had just finished publishing some pamphlets in support of Smectimnus. In fact, Smectimnus versus Hall is a great example of the religious tensions that would push the country towards civil war. I also mentioned that these pamphlets would not be the last pamphlets Milton would write. In fact, he's about to write a whole lot more. But first, we have some happy news. Milton has decided it's time to take a wife. So, in 1642, the 34-year-old Milton marries the 16-year-old Mary Powell. I agree. It's a little weird. But maybe they knew what they were talking about back then. Maybe such a wide age gap will work out. One month after they marry, Mary Powell moves back in with her parents. Well, that's all right. War just broke out. Maybe she just wanted to be closer to her family in these trying times. Less than a year after they're married, Milton starts publishing tracts, arguing that no-fault divorce should not only be legal, but morally acceptable. Well then, there you have it. Marital bliss. In all fairness, Mary Powell will move back in with Milton in 1645, and they'll have four kids together. But I imagine those first couple of days back were a little awkward. Now, Milton publishing the tracks on divorce probably didn't make him very popular with his wife, but it made him even less popular with Puritans, who control Parliament. He met pretty significant resistance to the tracks, 
and several religious figures sought to ban the tracks outright. For most people, angering your country and religious leaders would lead to your downfall. Remember that Galileo, who Milton met during his Europe trip, was basically destroyed by making enemies in the church. Milton, however, doubled down. Not only did he go on to write four tracts arguing for divorce, he brought his case to the Westminster Assembly. The Westminster Assembly was the religious group Parliament assigned to reform the Church of England. And they didn't really accept his argument for no-fault divorce, but they did start allowing some divorces. But Milton didn't stop there. He was so infuriated at the religious leaders trying to censor and ban his writing, he wrote another pamphlet. Areopagitica, a speech of Mr. John Milton for the liberty of unlicensed printing to the Parliament of England. This is Milton's magnum opus as far as non-fiction goes. Arguably, this is his magnum opus full stop, but that's an argument for another day. You see, English Parliament passed the Licensing Order of 1643 in, believe it or not, 1643. This required all authors to have a license from the government before they could publish anything. Basically, this allowed the government to censor all written work before it's published. Milton, who had faced government censorship in his first few tracks on divorce, rallied against this. He argued that no work should be censored before publication. Even if it's full of lies and slander and heretical thinking, it should be allowed to be published. Once it's published, it can be mocked, ignored, shunned, and punished by the law all you want, but let it get published first. Milton saw the danger in allowing the government to determine what's fit to print. Areopagitica is also full of religious examples, since he was trying to convince a hyper-religious parliament. He argues that the learned men from the Bible, like Paul, were learned because they read all kinds of books. Remember, if there's one thing Milton loves, it's reading. He also points out that the very first instance of licensing was instituted by the Catholics during the Spanish Inquisition. I'm sure the Protestant Parliament did not enjoy being linked to a group of fanatical Catholics like the Inquisition. So, Milton made his case for free speech. He stood up and used his considerable talents to fight against tyranny. Was he successful? Oh, God, no. The licensing order of 1643 would outlive Milton. In fact, it would become even harsher in the coming decades. But this wouldn't be Milton's magnum opus if the story ended there. When thinking about Areopagitica, I'm reminded of a quote from the West Wing. A potential Supreme Court nominee asks, who writes the extraordinary dissent? The one-man minority decision whose time hasn't come yet, but 20 years later, some circuit court clerk digs it up at three in the morning. Well, Milton's one-man minority decision would go on to be one of the most influential documents on the right to free speech and expression. Its influence on the Founding Fathers is clearly felt in the First Amendment, and Areopagitica is likely responsible for the Constitution of the United States outright prohibiting pre-publication censorship. The U.S. Supreme Court has quoted the pamphlet several times, as recently as 1961. A quote from Areopagitica is even displayed above the entrance to the New York Public Library's main reading room. A good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit, embalmed and treasured up on purpose to life beyond life. So, while Milton wasn't able to stop the attacks on free speech in his time, the legacy of his fight would inspire free speech for centuries to come. Around this time, Milton also publishes another pamphlet called Of Education, in which he calls for significant reforms to the education system based on his experience as a longtime student and a tutor. In 1645, Milton remembers he's supposed to be a poet and publishes a collection of poems, which is really just a republishing of a lot of his earlier poems, including Lysidas and The Mask Comus. Now, we know Parliament is winning its war against Milton, but let's check back and see how it's doing against the king, shall we? Well, by 1646, the English Civil War was over. Parliament won, and Charles was imprisoned. 
Oliver Cromwell, emerged as a leading military figure during the war, and will likely be the leader of the new government. So, now that there's peace in England... Wait, never mind. It's 1648, and the Second English Civil War just broke out. This time, Charles is sided with Scotland. Wait a minute, didn't this whole thing start as Charles versus Scotland? Oh, whatever. It's 1649 and the war's already over. Parliament won again. King Charles is put on trial for treason, which I believe is a first for a king. After a whole lot of debate, the House of Commons forms the High Court of Justice, which is honestly not that interested in justice. Regardless. They find Charles guilty, and they chop off his head. Well then, that's one way to end it. At least now, England can have some peace, and... Oh wait, never mind. Charles' son, Charles II, just allied with the Irish, and... Yep, the Third English Civil War has broken out. Charles II loses in 1651, and is exiled to France. Parliament is left in charge of England, and the English Commonwealth is born. Well, you could call it a Commonwealth. Or you could call it a Republic, if you wanted to make Milton happy. And for the record, that's why I didn't want to get into too much detail about the English Civil War. Because it's not one war. It's three. And in truth, it's more than that, if you start including Ireland and Scotland. This period is commonly referred to as the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, but I use the name English Civil War because Wars of the Three Kingdoms just makes me want to give up this whole podcast idea and go play Dynasty Warriors. Anyway, back to Milton. In 1649, after the end of the Second Civil War and the execution of Charles I, Milton publishes another pamphlet. This pamphlet argues that the people have the right to hold their kings accountable and explicitly condones the execution of Charles I. Realizing Milton is a powerful ally to have, Parliament hires him as the Secretary for Foreign Tongues. The Secretary for Foreign Tongues was required to write the Republic's foreign correspondence, and maybe write some propaganda every now and again. To understand why this was a pretty important job, let's put ourselves in Europe's shoes. England's citizens just killed their own king and took control. Who knows what they're going to do next? One of my college history professors once said that you could judge a country's reaction to another country overthrowing their leader by distance. If a country has a coup halfway around the world, who cares? If the country next to you overthrows their ruler, however, it's time to panic. If it happened that close to home, it might spread to you. You can really see this with the French Revolution and later the spread of communism. People only really start to care when it starts getting a little too close to home. So Milton, who had a pretty good reputation in Europe, was assigned to make this New England look less like an insane band of regicidal maniacs and more like a normal, functioning country. I hope you're ready for another pamphlet war, because Milton didn't get a lot of time to ease into the job. In 1649, a pamphlet called Icon Basilic was circulating. It was purported to be written by Charles I shortly before his death, and it paints him as an innocent Christian martyr. This pamphlet was incredibly popular, and Milton's first task was to try and counter it. So, Milton fires back with iconoclasties. It wasn't really successful in countering it, but it garnered a response nonetheless. A month later, Charles II and Claudius Salmasus, a French scholar, published Defensio Regia Pro Carolo Primo. In 1650, Milton is tasked by the Commonwealth to respond and defend the English people in the eyes of Europe. 1651 saw the publication of Defensio Pro Populo Anglicano, also known as the First Defense. This was Milton's great defense of the English people, written in Latin. Alexander Gill, his old schoolmaster who wrote a book on English grammar in Latin, was probably somewhere smiling. 
the first defense was very popular in Europe and received multiple printings. Around this time, Milton again remembers he's supposed to be a poet and dedicates his 16th sonnet to Oliver Cromwell, head of the Commonwealth. And, unfortunately, also around this time, Mary Powell, Milton's wife, dies due to complications following childbirth. Following this, Milton begins another change. This time, though, it's not a stylistic change. It's a physical one. While the exact year is disputed, Milton became fully blind somewhere between 1652 and 1655. So, from here on in, when I say Milton wrote, understand that Milton spoke and someone else wrote it down for him is likely a more accurate phrase, but Milton wrote is a lot less clunky. Well, it's been a while. I think it's time for another pit stop. This time, though, we're not talking about another person. Instead, I want to talk about my favorite Milton poem. Shortly after he was fully blind, Milton composed When I Consider How My Light Is Spent. You may have also heard it called On His Blindness. In it, Milton comes to terms with the new limitations he has and how they affect him in a religious context. Despite the fact that he yearns to do physical things to serve his God, he can't. His final conclusion being that God has not called him to do things he can no longer do, culminating in the line, They also serve who stand and wait. And this is such a Milton idea. In fact, he'll use this same concept to defend his lack of military service. When asked why he didn't actually fight in the Civil War, Milton argues that he served his country equally well through his writing as those who fought. He did what he was called to do. Anyway, go read when I consider how my light is spent. It's only 14 lines, you got time. Back in the Commonwealth, being blind did not get Milton out of his pamphlet war. The royalists have fired back with Regii sanguinis clamor ad colium adversus parasitis anglicanos. This pamphlet attacks not only the Commonwealth, but it also takes shots at Milton personally. Milton responds in 1654 with Defensio Secunda, or the Second Defense, defending himself and the Commonwealth. And if you remember our coverage of his Europe trip, I mentioned that I wasn't fully prepared to accept the one source we had about this trip, and that's because Defensio Secunda is that source, a propaganda pamphlet published in the middle of a war of words written in response to personal attacks. Milton has quite a few incentives to stretch the truth here. Milton would continue to receive personal attacks from the Royalists, inspiring Defensio Pro Se in 1655, which further defended himself against these attacks. In 1656, Milton decides to get married again. He marries Catherine Woodcock, whose age we do not know. I'm going to guess she's younger than Milton, though. She'll die due to complications surrounding childbirth two years later, in 1658. In the Commonwealth at large, we're seeing a bit of deja vu. Cromwell is so upset at Parliament, he marches 40 soldiers into the Parliament building and dissolves it by force. By 1657, the government offers Cromwell a crown, which he declines. And by 1658, he's dead. Don't mourn for him too much, though. His actions against Ireland are considered to be near genocidal by some, and by most accounts, he was a fairly horrible man. But he didn't die alone. His death sent the Commonwealth into a horrible downward spiral it's not going to recover from. The people in England realize their dreams of a republic are dying and are ready to go back to being a monarchy. Well. Most people. Milton's not one to back down, even when he's in the minority. So, in 1659 and 1660, Milton publishes pamphlet after pamphlet urging the English people to remember what they fought for. Just because Cromwell died, it doesn't mean the Commonwealth has to die with him. And you know what? Milton's words are persuasive. But they're not 
that persuasive. In 1660, the English monarchy was restored, and King Charles II was invited back. Thus begins the reign of the king who brought back partying. 1660 saw Milton out of a job and sent into hiding, as there was now a warrant out for his arrest. Believe it or not, spending a decade writing pamphlets against the idea of a monarchy does not make you very popular with the new monarch. Before long, Charles II issues a general pardon, and Milton comes out of hiding, only to be arrested anyway. Many prominent Commonwealth leaders that were arrested were executed for treason. But Milton still has some powerful friends. He's released from jail, and thus Milton transforms one last time. After 1660, Milton pretty much stops writing anything remotely political, and would only publish a handful of prose works, and they were on much less confrontational topics than his earlier work. He publishes things like a book on logic, and a book on the history of England. Not quite as controversial as advocating for divorce or justifying regicide. In fact, for the rest of his life, Milton lives a very quiet life. Milton, after 1660, reminds me of Horace, the Roman poet who influenced his college poetry all those years ago. Horace fought to establish a republic, but after he was defeated, he never really caused any more political trouble. Milton's rebellion was a little more successful, but his fate is ultimately the same. In 1663, Milton marries his third and final wife, Elizabeth Minshall. For those of you wondering if Milton has learned his lesson by this point, the answer is no. Elizabeth was born in 1638, the year Milton left for Europe. She is 31 years younger than Milton. In fact, she's only eight years older than Milton's firstborn daughter. So Milton lives out the rest of his days, in peace and quiet, he has three daughters that live to adulthood, Anne, Mary, and Deborah, all from his first marriage. The two nephews he tutored, they went on to be writers in their own right. And well, we seem to be wrapping up here, but you may have noticed we seem to have missed something. The one thing people know about Milton is that he wrote Paradise Lost, and we haven't even mentioned it. That's because, when looking at Milton's life as a whole... Paradise Lost seems simultaneously an afterthought and a capstone. Paradise Lost was first published in 1667, seven years into Milton's quiet period, and seven years before his death in 1674. So what is Paradise Lost, and why is it important? Paradise Lost is an epic poem, in the spirit of oversimplification, which is really what this podcast is all about. An epic poem is just a long poem that tells a story. Typically, they're centered around human kings and queens with pagan deities off in the wings. Think Beowulf or the Iliad. Paradise Lost, however, focuses on a non-royal human couple, Adam and Eve, and Christian deities. Now, there is a king, but it's a demonic king. Also worth noting is Milton's blank verse. Blank verse is non-rhyming poetry that still conforms to a meter, typically iambic pentameter. That means that each line in Milton's Paradise Lost is ten syllables long, with every other syllable being stressed. Milton's use of blank verse is pretty much unanimously exalted. Before him, no one had really used blank verse for anything other than plays. Milton's use of blank verse in Paradise Lost is so good that for the next century or so, poets will attempt to copy Milton's use of blank verse, and for the next century or so, they will mostly fail miserably. Milton's blank verse is often imitated, but rarely duplicated. Cut all those poets some slack, though. They probably didn't celebrate getting their master's degree with six years of self-directed study. But perhaps the best-known feature of Paradise Lost is its portrayal of Satan. If I were to tell you that someone wrote a book that makes you sympathize with the devil himself, your first instinct wouldn't be that the author is a devout Christian, like Milton. But let's roll with it. 
Let's look at Satan's storyline here and see if we can figure out why Milton would make him such a sympathetic character. We join Satan immediately following his fall. Satan and his demons just staged a revolt against God, their king. Their rebellion ultimately fails. Cast down, Satan decides with his most famous quote that it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. A figure that rebels against his king, and despite ultimately failing, still believes his cause is just and is just waiting for the next chance to strike. I can't imagine why Milton would want you to sympathize with a character like that. This portrayal of Satan would go on to be one of the most influential characters in English literature. The romantic poets, who are right around the corner, are going to fall in love with Milton's Satan. Their coming obsession with problematic and flawed characters was likely rooted in Paradise Lost. And that's Paradise Lost. It, like a lot of Milton's work, did not make its greatest impact in his lifetime. It was a pretty successful epic poem, but it didn't make him filthy rich or anything. Just a popular poem that was just starting to take root. Milton would follow up Paradise Lost with the less well-known sequel, Paradise Regained, in 1671. And well, would you look at that? It took him almost 60 years to publish his first epic poem, but he published his second just four years later. I guess now that he's retired, Milton's got some time on his hands. In 1674, Milton passes away at the age of 65. I don't have much more to talk about with his death, so instead... Let's flash forward to 1995. An author by the name of Philip Pullman is searching for a name for his upcoming trilogy. Being an avid Milton fan, he stumbles upon this passage from Paradise Lost. Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature and perhaps her grave, of neither sea nor shore nor air nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly, and which thus must ever fight, unless the Almighty Maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss the weary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while. Well, there you have it. John Milton read his way to prominence, only to have his reading destroy his vision. He wrote and argued against censorship, only for his arguments to be ignored. He fought hard to build a republic, only for that republic to run right back into the waiting arms of the monarchy. He worked hard and studied harder, but his work seems to be in vain. No divorce law, no repeal of the Licensing Act, no republic. Was the work worth it? That's not an easy question to answer. As far as a poetic legacy, Milton is considered by some to be the second best poet of the English language, behind only Shakespeare. His work inspired free speech and is used to combat censorship. I imagine he'd be pretty proud of that, but England still has a monarch, even if the role is largely symbolic at this point. So, I find myself stuck. For a long time, I went about my daily life while John Milton sat, nagging me from the back of my mind. As I lay in bed at night, unable to sleep, Milton's life would flash by my mind. And when I woke up, he was still there, sitting silently in my head, waiting for me to figure out how this thing was going to end. I was effectively being haunted by John Milton, always silently asking me, One question. Was it worth it? Well, let's look back. He was disliked in Rome because he wouldn't stop talking about Protestantism to Catholics. He published pamphlet after pamphlet arguing for divorce, despite the hyper-religious atmosphere of England at the time. After Cromwell's death, he was still there supporting the Republic, even though seemingly everyone else in the nation accepted defeat and wanted a king back. Even when he was old and blind, he wrote about a failed rebellion just waiting for their next chance to strike. Milton spoke out at every opportunity in defense of his beliefs, 
even when silence was the more prudent decision. He fearlessly and ferociously argued for what he believed in. He never shied away from his convictions. And that's a legacy to be proud of. Don't get me wrong, don't just be a contrarian to be a contrarian, but figure out what you believe in and fight for it. But if you've been married less than a year, don't publicly argue for the legality of divorce. Or at least use a pseudonym.